contrast the sort of criticism that Normani or Ari Lennox received, but like a Sto Allegra, who's a woman of color, but she's absolutely not black, but who gets hailed as the cinematic soul, but sis has no range. She, that most Sto Allegra is given two sharps and a flat. That's it, nothing more, baby. Hey guys, it's Julesy and it is March. And the best part of March is always airy season. And we are just a few days out from my birthday. Getting to it. Airy season is the best season. I will fight you over that. Don't try me. And so we're here for a very special treat. Thanks to Audible. As always, Audible coming through in the clutch. If you new to it, even if you chew to it, go over to audible.com slash Julesy or text Julesy to 500-500 and get your first month free on Audible because Audible is almost always the reason why I pull up and find the post. And Audible is also seeing me through because this month in the book club, SBG, come on over, join. Bring a donation because we got to go fund me so we can keep on going. Having it over there too. But we are reading Nella Larson's Passing, which is also a Netflix movie. And what's so dope about Passing on Audible is that it is read by Tessa Thompson, who also has one of the leading roles in the Netflix movie version of Passing. Love to see it. And Passing is such a short listen. It is an incredibly influential book in the canon of black literature. And so I'm very excited to finally have the discussions in the book club about passing. I'm excited to get through my listening of the passing audiobook. And I hope you come on over and join us. And along your way, sign up for Audible, audible.com slash Julesy or text Julesy to 500 500. You know, it's the only way I'm able to do all the things I do. Grad school, book club, YouTuber, content creator. It's all here in my ability to pull up some really dope audiobooks and find all our reads from the book club on Audible. It's so dope and I really appreciate their support and helping me to um, <clears throat> still be a YouTuber. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, <laughs> we might not be here right now, all right? This video, we're talking about R&B and colorism. Shout out to Henny who helped to co-research and co-write and co-outline this video. And the fact that she was co-signed by two industry giants that also are renowned colorists like Prince and Drake tells me everything I kind of need to know. And also the fact that for a while her Instagram just kind of looked like this. It was monotone or sepia tone of her next to black men. Early career like Sade cosplay that helped push that racial ambiguity sort of thing that pairs with the globalization of R&B. And she was heavily invested in that image to the point where people pressed her about her heritage and then she shared this uh, picture of her father sporting a popular appropriated hairstyle for the time like that could easily be Alex Trebek in the 70s. We are approaching the the topic of colorism within specifically the R&B genre of music because I think people understand that colorism absolutely exists and particular for R&B singer which typically signifies black woman singer that colorism is understood from a historical perspective that we understand that there have been musicians and singers who have not gotten their proper due who have been erased and who have been you know kept in the shadows of the music industry we understand that from like a historical like people from the past but I don't know that we understand the way colorism still very negatively impacts people that we might perceive as successful and it definitely impacts our more contemporary musicians. And so we're going to get in to that discussion here because the history of pop music is built upon minstrelsy. And on my Patreon, I previously had an interview with my friend Kwame, who's a professor of ethnomusicology at NYU. And we talked about the racial history of how music genres are defined. And Kwame actually makes the point that pop music, the term pop artist, was actually used to define early on black music. And that the first recorded pop artist is a black musician. So one of the first um, pop stars that we can talk about seriously in the United States was a, a black street performer called George W. Johnson that was picked up by the New Jersey Phonograph Company in the 1890s to record a type of song 
that was very popular on the vaudeville stage, and that was called Coon Songs, right? A lot of the early recordings of white musicians is actual minstrel music. It was huge in America. And so early pop music coming from white artists was minstrel music. It was a co-opting and parodying of black music. You know, minstrel included the blackface. It included um, promulgating negative stereotypes of black people. Now within that framework, it is important to understand how we define R&B and the R&B artists. And R&B stands for rhythm and blues because genre making is imbued with racial language. And this has heavily influenced the space afforded, particularly to dark skinned black women navigating the music industry today. And when we think about what R&B means, rhythm and blues, there is an actual technical definition for what quantifies something as rhythm and blues soul versus what quantifies something as pop music. But we understand that that technical aspect is very rarely followed. And for the most part, pop music signifies a white singer and R&B signifies black singer. You know, when you think of like a Beyonce and Four being a traditional R&B album, all of her albums still get nominated in the R&B category because she's a black woman. In ways that you would never see like an Ariana Grande who definitely pedals in, you know, culturally black sounds be nominated or placed in the R&B category. Race always defines the music genre, and that is particularly true for R&B. So in an interview conducted for Billboard in 2020, writer Gail Mitchell expresses this statement that I think is really useful here. She states that the industry has long put artists in boxes based on what they look like, not the music they actually make. And that's exactly true for R&B artists of color who still encounter assumptions from industry gatekeepers about the reach of their music. And this quote is useful because it can be reframed to address the issues of colorism within the black R&B space. And do I even need to say black here just within the R&B space because you know exactly what I'm saying. And in modern times, even as black artists are being signed to black owned labels, black owned imprints, and they are managed by these black owned labels and black A&R agencies, it's almost like a veneer that these companies can say they're black owned because they also exist within the ecosystem and they're attached attached to one of the three conglomerate record music labels. So that would be Sony, Universal, or Warner Music. Everyone gets cycled through there. And so you're still getting the historical issues that have existed within the music industry promulgated even as we see more black executives and black ownership celebrated within the music industry. Is it really changing the powers that be? And is it really bringing in a new understanding and dismantling systems of harm and oppression? <laughs> I don't think so because dark skinned women still are finding that they have to fight against patriarchy, misogyny, colorism, fat phobia, featureism, and just general anti-blackness in order to simply be seen or not pigeonholed. Black women still today exist within a catechism of present invisibility or being there but not there. We know they exist, we just don't recognize them. Globalization is happening, right? And globalization within the music industry is a very active, conscious force in that the music executives want globalization to happen. They are speeding up the process. They are encouraging it. What globalization means, this is something that I talked about in my video two years ago about Billie Eilish, and then also my video about TikTok having a race problem, right? Globalization means that black culture becomes the base of American culture and black culture and really any cultural markers from ethnic minorities is sanitized and made palatable for a general, which often signifies white, audience and this is exactly how we end up with when, what the point i was making in the billy eilish video is why i wouldn't be inclined to claim that billy eilish is culturally appropriating because she's what 19 20 years old and she comes from this generation where for them 
all the culture they were surrounded with was a sort of sanitized, watered down black culture. And so those are the influences that she's absorbing and it's going to define the way she may dress and carry herself within reason. You know what I mean? It's a very fine line. You know, globalization means we end up with black culture being the foundation of American culture, but with limited to non-existent ability for black people to gain power, positive notoriety, or profit from even their own being and identity, which is what I talked about in my TikTok has a race problem, which you very much so see on TikTok as young black kids are often the creators of a lot of the viral sounds, the dances, the trends that happen on that app. But as soon as you click on the sound that this black person created, it's all white people. And oftentimes it's the white people that get the most visibility and opportunity from co-opting, as we saw with the renegade dance, co-opting the creations of black artists who until another white power comes in, oh, that sounds so horrible to say white power, but another, you know, powerful person that typically is white comes in and speaks up for them, they're left without the opportunity, right? Like a literal hand had to come down and help Jalea, the young girl who created the renegade dance and say that she deserved the opportunity and give her that right up in the New York Times before anybody recognized her. And you know, I, I go all the way into that in the TikTok has a race problem video so you can get into there. Let's stay on the R&B music side here. But I wanna move into, you know, I always gotta mention some theory. <laughs> Don't worry, this video will not be too theoretical. We're not gonna get too academic here. But you know, I love me some Dr. Patricia Hill Collins. I love me some Dr. Hortense Spillers and Dr. Collins controlling images and Dr. Spillers metanomic names that are not names. When you say metanomic, like one of the examples I can give is like when you call like businessmen suits. But when you're using signifiers like suit or like inanimate objects to represent people. Um, and I think both of these theories about metanomics and then Dr. Collins controlling images speak to this concept of visual linguistic laws that relegate black women, particularly dark skinned black women, into the visual language of ugly and unfeminine. And that then fits into these stereotypical tropes of Mammy, Jezebel, and controlling matriarch. And it's not to, I'm not, like, I want you to be very clear in what I'm saying here, because I'm not implying inherently that dark-skinned Black women are these things, but that the visual linguistic laws make it very easy to dismiss and dispose of them as such things. These tropes that are constantly lobbied onto dark skinned black women. And in the R&B scene, what we end up happening is black women being pigeonholed into soul inspired retro or church rear styled of R&B, where that's the only way that they can be recognized or celebrated as singers. <laughs> what's the foundation of a lot of R&B is the black church. And in the black church, we see that there's a binding sacralized politic of silence and invisibility of black women, where we could see a plethora of examples in gospel music, especially in the mass choir era of hearing the voice, understanding the value that voice adds sonically, but having no acknowledgement of the individual, the person and the craft behind the sonic element it adds to mass choir productions. And often there's a choir director who's a man taking the credit for the production of the song. And so in the contemporary pop music scene, the politics of silence and invisibility have black women's identities flattened into very limited, industry archetypes that can yield significant praise, but only in certain spaces and only at certain times. We're gonna talk about even more recent R&B singers, but you could think of like a Fantasia. You could think of these black women who have come into this sphere, a Jennifer Hudson, and the way they are memified, they are criticized, they are made fun of, often feeds into like these very, very specific tropes that we like to flatten 
dark skinned black women's identities into. You know, and then you see it in the way that the music industry deals with them. And part of the reason why I even wanted to approach this topic was because I used to work in the music industry. And something that has always stuck with me is when I was trying to bring in black women artists, how often I was told that black women singers are too expensive to curate as artists. And it's wild to me when you consider how formulaic historically the music industry has been, especially on the white pop side, right? You get one hit and suddenly you get a bunch of other singers who mirror an Ariana Grande, who mirror a Miley Cyrus, who mirror a boy band, a, a Nickelback, a Maroon 5, you know? There's so many, you know, almost panache exists in the white pop space uncritically but on the black music side, where the, at the time period when I was in the music industry, Rihanna's um, management took a huge risk and put a good bit of money behind her that the label was not offering, right? And decided to invest in her and invest in her strategically. And it has paid 30 million times over. We've seen the success that Rihanna has climbed to, but why is the industry so hesitant to replicate that? But they're so quick to replicate it on the pop white music side. Black women are flattened and then that is these flattenings of their identity are often the excuses given as to why they cannot be taken seriously as viable superstars or what's the term for somebody that's a highly successful musician, right? That's what I mean by superstar, right? And oftentimes now in the contemporary music industry, it's about who can cross over to pop, which basically who can we sell to a white audience? Who will the, the white majority accept and, and buy their albums and show up to their concerts for and we could really profit off of but if you can't tap into that white market we don't see it's possible but like how is even the consumer trained to accept or to engage in certain music and I think there definitely is a history lesson that can be given here about the way media has historically worked within America and how media has historically been used to signify racial stereotypes and so I think as Americans we are trained to relegate race, even if it's not something we're consciously thinking about, but to relegate race into how we engage with the arts. And this makes the stakes much higher for dark skinned women who are scrutinized and criticized more openly and severely than their light skin counterparts. And you contrast, you could contrast the sort of criticism that Normani or Ari Lennox received, but like a Snow Allegra, who's a woman of color, but she's absolutely not black, but who gets hailed as the cinematic soul, which he has a very limited range. You know, I did a video on my Patreon, a lot of Patreon videos about the music scene, right? Um, but I did a video about how colorism has benefited Snow Allegra's career and gave some insight to that, but sis has no range. She, that most Snow Allegra is given two sharps and a flat. That's it, nothing more, baby. When we look at current examples of how colorism influences R&B singers and dark skinned black women in the industry, I already talked, I already name checked Normani, but Normani came up in a pop girl group, Fifth Harmony, and she's been subjected to so much racism. There's so many receipts and clips of how her bandmates, the, her management and producers have treated her. And she's talked about being left off of records altogether and being used strategically in the group for the urban, <laughs> urban market appeal. You know, there's clips of her have, um, while on tour going out of her way to being like the most prepared for the tour and, and rehearsing and really getting into the singing and the dance. And she's a wonderful dancer while the rest of her bandmates just lounge around and chill out, right? There was a, all the expectation of Normani having to show up in ways that her bandmates were never asked to show up. It's very visible throughout her time in Fifth Harmony. There's even footage of crew members refusing to spotlight her on stage during a performance. It's insidious and her career trajectory has definitely been impacted by this colorism and then the public's perception of what a dark skinned black woman is supposed to or allowed to be. And she's spoken about not feeling supported in the pop music scene with her single motivation and how she finds herself being pressured to check off all these boxes about being the right 
type of black girl and showing up in the right kind of way for black women. And she's also been the victim of technical gaps that just seem a little, mm, happen a little too often for us to just be like, oh, it's just a coincidence. It just happened out of a, a sincere mistake. It's like, are y'all treating the artistry of dark-skinned black women with less respect than the way that you understand you cannot mess up for people that you perceive as big pop stars. In 2019 at the VMA, she had an issue with her in-ear audio midway through a performance. And you're performing to a big crowd like that, your in-ear is very important because you can't necessarily hear yourself project and sing. And that's how you stay on key. And that's how you also keep up with the dance, you know, all these technical aspects. And so she later on in an interview, you know, she did great in the performance, but she later on in an interview talked about how stressful that moment for was for her and how it, you know, further triggered her depression. Uh, and then two years later, very recently, last year in 2021, her Wild Side single and wonderful girl, I wish I could dance, I bust out a little move for you right now, but I can't. But her Wild Side music video was heavily featured in VMA marketing and promotional materials, but she was left off of the performance roster. Unlike, and I mean, I think, I think Chloe Bailey is really easy to talk about because Chloe Bailey gets a lot of discussion. Um, it gets a lot of visibility and I don't think it's necessarily undeserved, right? And I think the inclination for me here to want to talk about Chloe is that it's not like this outlandish persona who deserves absolutely nothing like a Mariah the Scientist or a Sweetie. Like Chloe comes with a very high level talent, but I think there is a, an understanding how we can see then how that high level talent is being promoted and how different that is for dark skinned black women. Chloe deserves, but also what's happening over here. I think there's enough room for all of these women to exist. But Chloe Bailey, who had just come out with snippets of her first single, her first single is getting primetime stage time at the VMA, at the VMA Awards. And, you know, Normani's fan base definitely, like, you know, they definitely pitched a fit on social media. People definitely had some questions about the colorism that was behind this. But she doesn't get added to the roster until maybe a week out from the VMAs because Lordy, is it Lordy or is it Lord Girl? <laughs> I remember one song from like when I was in college, babes. But Lordy drops off the performance list and then Normani is brought in as a fill-in. And then we again have a technical issue happen during her performance that didn't appear during the rehearsals, but suddenly mysteriously during her performance, these technical issues are populating. It's like, who are you taking serious? Who are you prioritizing? Who are you actually giving your attention to? But in this interview that Normani did with Justine and Ryan, they were breaking down how it feels like there's only room for one black girl in the industry at a time. And they express that this is not an issue for their white contemporaries who dominate the airwaves. And to quote Normani, she states that, times have obviously changed where there's more roles and spaces for black women but there still doesn't seem to be enough, or at least society doesn't allow us to feel like there's enough for all of us to exist the way we see in other non-Black communities. When it comes to Black women, they always kind of make us believe that there's only room for one. And in 2021, we know there's not some small limited landscape that these girls are promoting themselves to. There's more than enough room for everyone to get similar opportunities and support in putting out their music. Moving on to Ari Lennox. Whew, Ari has been dealing with colorism since the onset of her career. Now, Shea Butter Baby was her big break and I was so happy to see it. I love some Ari Lennox, but even though Ari has spoken out against the claims of colorism that have pit her against Chloe Bailey, I think she wasn't denying that colorism has negatively impacted her career or denying that light skin privilege exists. What she was doing was pushing back against the bad faith actors who simply will co-opt language to drive drama and wedges. Like these people really didn't care about colorism. It was a way for them to throw a dig at Chloe Bailey and not actually have a critical conversation about colorism. And so I think she was pushing back against bad faith 
these actors because the discourse around Ari has frequently tripped over to viral featurism on Twitter. She has gotten some really nasty attacks where her along with other dark skinned women singers are called or correlated or paralleled or however you want to animals. They are denigrated and people have memefied her and use those memes to like hide their anti-blackness and bigotry in jokes. But it's really telling if we consider who frequently gets turned into a meme for candid discussions, who frequently gets turned into memes so other people can make jokes. Mm. I don't like that. I personally believe that I am the number one fan of one Jasmine Sullivan. Ooh, girl. Oh man, I was about to throw on my Jasmine Sullivan shirt, but you know, we on a time crunch. Otherwise I would've gone downstairs and got my shirt. But mm -mm. Jasmine has been in the music industry since she is 15 years old. And she first had a record deal with Jive and they mm -hmm, dropped her. And so she went on to be a background vocalist and then that's when she was introduced to Missy Elliott, the queen herself, who helped to produce Jasmine's debut album on Jay Arista Records, Fearless. Now, when she was at Jay Records, I felt like they were mismanaging her and not even simply mismanaging her. I felt like I knew because I was working at Good Music at the time, so it was Sony Building. I know exactly how these marketing meetings go. I know exactly how they throw people under the bus and they'd be like, oh, your song wasn't successful, but they put no money. No, at the time, street promo was a thing. The blog, new media was what it's called, was a thing. And then, you know, radio play. And you're not putting any of these resources that you put behind the pop artists. You're not putting it behind these artists and then claiming, oh, they didn't do any sales. And I felt like it was very clear when Fearless came out that her handlers at the label or whoever she was, the team that they were putting together for her, didn't understand how to dress her, how to, um, put the right resources behind a, a fat black woman and you know you get dismissed because you're not supposed to be seen publicly again we had this flattening of an identity that says that she doesn't have the opportunity to be the big pop star because of her image and because of fat phobia and I think that was ridiculous I actually emailed her team <laughs> and they asked, they got back to me and told me no <laughs> if I had to find that email one day, I wonder if I still have it. But I emailed her team because I felt like Jasmine had the talent. She's a beautiful girl. And I don't think size should have ever been a deterrence. Like, like, come on, you know, maybe this was, just, you know, a decade and a half before we get Lizzo. But I felt like there was definitely a way to just get her a stylist who understood her body type. Stop using these people that only work with skinny folk and promote this singer because she just had, she not only has the beautiful voice, but she's a, an amazing songwriter. And she had the bops. She had the hits. It could have made it. You know, bust your windows out the car. Busting windows out your car. You know, busting some windows out the car, babes. 10 for 10. I, see, I saw it for Jasmine. And I felt like there was no reason why this girl had to pay her dues for so long to finally get some notoriety. But even now, as much as I love hotels and as much as I love seeing Jasmine on tour, and as much as I see love seeing her get her flowers, I think it's very interesting who is offering the flowers. Black women, you know what I mean? And you know, racist ass Grammys, Jasmine has been nominated 15 times but has never won a Grammy. Something ain't right. Something ain't hitting. And Jasmine has talked about not being as recognized as her white soul contemporaries like an Adele. Why do British soul singers, you know, I love me some Sam Smith, baby, that disclosure remix a latch, chokehold, okay? But why he get to be doing stadium tours? Gets all the play, Adele, like this huge, you know, look at her. She even has to get up there herself and be like, you know, Beyonce should have won this. But why do they get this celebration? And not only just a celebration, why, do the why does the music industry understand 
the viability of their success and understand how to promote them, but can't seem to get behind Jasmine Sullivan. But to that point, Jasmine said, I think it's just a matter of making myself known to more people. I think it's about spreading Jasmine Sullivan's brand. I guess to more people. There may not be as many people who listen to Adele, but there are people who are listening. There are people who appreciate me and there are people who love my music. But Adele just doesn't get those numbers overnight without a machine behind her. And if that machine got behind dark skinned black women in a similar manner, I guarantee you we would have very similar outputs. But we have an industry and a consumer base that consistently says, no, you have to work not twice, but three times as hard. You have to be a different kind of talented before we ever give you your due. It absolutely seems that even with undeniable musicianship, and the approval of some of the greatest musicians in the world, artists like Jasmine Sullivan still have to deal with the lack of visibility that comes from how and who the music industry decides to coalesce behind. I think particularly when we get into like somebody like a Summer Walker, Summer actually highlights, and I talked about this in a previous Get Ready With Me. My Get Ready With Me's from late 2019 were always a little bit of a mess. But one of the women who used to be on Summer Walker's team actually DM'd me after and was like, yo girl, you are totally right. Thank you for saying that. But I was talking about, you know, what it means for an artist like Summer to be signed to Love Renaissance, which is an imprint on Interscope that is run by all young black men. And she is their premier artist on the label. Similarly, Ari Lennox is signed to J. Cole's Dreamville, where she's the only woman on the roster. And you have teams that are largely black men. And I think when it comes to Summer, that they haven't figured out a strategy or a strategic way to work with her social anxiety. There's, if she has social anxiety, there's no reason that she should be doing VIP meet and greets if that triggers her anxiety, but they do that because that's how artists make money on tour is through the merch table and upselling VIP tickets that really don't cost them anything to provide the VIP services. You paying three, four hundred dollars just so you can get to the show an hour early and stand and take a picture with the artist essentially. And that is a big money maker on tours, but obviously that don't work for summer. Why y'all setting her up like that? Got her out here looking dry as hell in an Amazon concert rather than strategically setting up the environment where she can flourish. I use this term handlers to represent like the, the PR, the marketing, the A&R, the talent agency, your, your family, your friends, like handlers to like the whole sort of ecosystem that helps produce a music artist, right? I like, I wonder, like where are the handlers for Ari and Summer? Especially when they're dealing with this hyper visibility of criticism that's just constantly an onslaught for them. And then people are like so mean when they express publicly their hurt from the way people are talking about them on the internet or not even talking about them, but the way people approach them and accost them and bring this sort of violent rhetoric to them. Like where are their teams of people and do they understand? And I think even the way that something happened a couple years ago and in even when Ari was getting called like a, a pit bull or whatever and the way that she later apologized for being upset about that. And I was like, I, I feel like that's some, that's when you got niggas on your team and men tell you to get over it and it's not that bad and don't be mad about it. And it's whatever, just, you know what I mean? It happens, whatever, whatever. Versus having, you know, black women and queer folk on your team who will be much more understanding of how mean and hurtful having to deal with these things are and can come in and support you in the proper way. Like, you know, I already mentioned Chloe and I definitely think she has a, te a, a team of handlers that includes black women and queer folk who are very supportive of her. I think Lil Nas X is a great example of that like sort of team of handlers that comes in and is really supportive because he gets a lot of heat and violent messaging and he set up in a way where he can kind of troll and be above it and you know maneuver in a safe space around it 
we I don't see that happening for Summer and Ari. Even though they're signed to black owned labels and these labels are largely run by black men, black men in the music industry have long been progenitors of the colorism. Babes, the colorism is insipid. It's there. It's in the industry and they might deny it and they might, you know, usher out the one or two people that they work with, but there's a bevy of black, dark skinned black women who they have been quick to dismiss, quick to erase, quick to not support. On the very far end of the spectrum, I think it's worth talking about Azalea Banks. The way that Azalea has historically been so quickly turned into meme fodder. And I know people are inclined to talk about, you know, the way she practices Santeria or the different beliefs she has. And yes, she herself has peddled in colorism and fat phobia and been very mean to other black people. And I'm not condoning that at all, nor am I excusing it. But people will turn Azalea into a meme and then ignore how she got to that point of rage. And they won't reflect on their role in that because it doesn't benefit them too. When her career was kind of on the up and up, Azalea was assaulted by Russell Crowe, then gaslit by RZA, and then across social media, she was eventually built up to be sort of like this raging bully who now the blogs only post when she's ranting about something. It's like they almost seek out and encourage Azalea to rant because that helps their engagement when they post and talk bad about her. And it's wild because the Kardashians and the Jenners are sitting right there and they were first the strategy of understanding outrage as a social currency. They will drum up outrage on purpose, say outlandish things, for profit, for visibility, for engagement. And Azalea doesn't have the opportunity to benefit from the outrage that she stirs in the same way that the Kardashian Jenners have become so good at it. And if you kind of take this context of Azalea and bring it back to like a Ari or a Summer, when you think about how have their trauma responses to critical hypervisibility manifested in the public forum? How have people on the internet driven these women to mental and emotional instability by saddling them with emotional labor to weave through this sort of violent messaging, this constant critical den denigration. But we are asking these women to present in, in a very specific way in order for us to be able to extend love and care and compassion to them. But we're asking them to keep all the work they have to do to always show up as that person behind closed doors and to never have a break and to never be overwhelmed and to never break down from that. You just take everything, everything that gets thrown at you, let it slide off your back. Now we get exa into examples of how colorism has benefited women in the industry. You know, I've already mentioned Snow Allegra so many times. Two flats and a sharp type singer, but she has 3.9 million monthly listeners on Spotify. And it's interesting because, you know, when she came onto the scene, it's not an accident that her single climbed the charts, right? It's not an accident that on her social media, she is constantly visually surrounded by black men, that her entire band is made up of black men, that she is then, why the hell was have somebody having to do with the cover of Usher song? So bad, but she's getting these opportunities and she's cosplaying as Sade and people are then questioning, ooh, what is she? What is she? What is she? What is she? But it's like, you know, you giving water down Sade, boo, and it, it, it works so well for her entering into the urban market and then quickly being allowed to cross over into the pop music scene. Then we get Ella May. Oh man, between Ella May, who's British, was found by DJ Mustard, and Georgia Smith, you know, the British biracials, <laughs> blocked on Spotify for me. <laughs> Ella May doesn't know Aretha Franklin's music and Georgia was discovered by Drake. And that's a, a common trait between all these women who kind of benefit from colorism is how big of a fan Drake and then the king of, you know I mean? we One day we on Patreon, I'm gonna have to talk about Prince's colorism. Cause Prince be right behind there. Every light, bright, biracial has a cosign from Prince, all right? Uh, G Georgia got put on through a collaboration with Drake and some of the songs she's then been allowed to be featured on, oh girl. I don't even know who Mariah the scientist really is until we started digging into this. This is all Henny on the on the talk, bringing this to our attention here because I, I was watching a Tiana and Powers video about whisper singers and she talked about Mariah the scientist and I'm like, I have never heard of this 
girl. Am I that old? But she's a songwriter who people, some people say she's good, but sis can't sing. She has no performance skills. Don't sound nothing like the record. It's bad. But she's often, much like another light bright who's not an R&B singer, so we ain't even really talk about her here, but Sweetie, who's often afforded opportunities to perform on major stages, even with truly lackluster performance skills. Uh, there's Queen Nyjah, who comes from the output of young prank couple <laughs> channels on YouTube and has one too many colorist statements clocked and logged on this app for Reed really to ever get behind. But let's get in, so let's not give too much attention to the light brights here, right? I definitely also wanna in include some people that deserve more recognition in the contemporary music scene. We have Dawn Richards of Diddy Kane fame, which is one of the more notable girl groups of the 2000s, but she is putting out electro R&B and isn't getting recognized for all the talent she's bringing to the table. Justine Sky, definitely I've been listening and bopping to her album since I went to the concert in Charlotte a couple weeks ago. Amber Riley, 99K monthly listeners on Spotify, but since was on a top primetime television show and she was the talent. You know, she's always going viral for her song clips on social media and she's put out an EP, but just has not gotten that same support that like, I mean, Miley Cyrus is a good bit of nepotism as is for Ariana Grande, but they both came out of Disney TV shows. There's a whole host of white pop singers who have come out of TV and that doesn't seem to work the same way for black women who aren't necessarily doing kid music. Amber deserves more than deserves. And she's just largely been ignored outside of niche black spaces. And she has a beautiful voice. It's a testament that like, she was the soloist on almost every episode of Glee, that she was, that so many of her moments on Glee have gone viral. She's featured on the Terrell show here on YouTube, you know, a uh, song association, clips of her singing on song association are constantly going viral, but it's not translating over to her music because how is her music being promoted? Because where's a music record music label at? Where's a team at? You know what I mean? They know how to back the white artists, but they seem to be lost in the sauce when it comes to someone like Amber Riley, but she has all the makings and all the trappings. Get it popping, turn it up. I do think as consumers, we have a role here. This video isn't to imply that you need to stop listening to any of the people that benefit from colorism that I have mentioned, right? The way that we invest in the visual linguistic laws of silencing and invisibility of black women the way we decide who to take seriously, the way we participate in memification. If we could just be a little bit more conscious of the way that we're engaging with art and promoting art. And I don't really think the responsibility wholly comes down on us or even majorly comes down on us. I think this is way more an issue, as I said at the beginning of the video, of the music industry. But if we participate in refusing to acknowledge things like colorism in our community, we are helping promulgate what leads to dark skinned black women having fewer chances of being seen and supported in the music industry. There's just no color blindness. It does not exist. We see color, we speak color. It's embedded in our language. And there is a lot of negative relationships that is fostered within the current climate of social media and parasocial relationships where people will follow to hate. People will follow to antagonize. People will follow to memeify. The internet and social media has created more avenues where, yeah, there's more ways for you to promote and from way more ways to create visibility and to get your music out, but there's also more ways that for people to be violent towards you. There's also more ways for people to harass you. I absolutely believe that the treatment of dark skinned black women in the R&B music scene and in the music industry at large is a mirror to what is experienced as tangible harm in the real world. 110%. Thanks for watching. 
Thanks for tuning in. Shout out to Audible for sponsoring this video. Definitely audible.com slash Julesy or text Julesy to 500-500 and get your first month free. Come on over. You know, if it's keeping me on here, you definitely should give it an opportunity. And then join the SBG Book Club. Come on over, help out our donation drive, or get into the reading. Passing this month is our reading for March. See you on the other side. Deuces! <laughs>